Okay, well, hello everybody, and a very warm welcome to our fourth online video tasting. And this month, we are focusing on the classic wines of Spain. Now, before we get started, can I just say, it's been absolutely fantastic to receive so many emails, uh, phone calls, just saying how many of you have been watching, tuning into the videos, and the creativity uh, around the way that people have used Zoom to connect with friends, family, not only in this country, but across continents as well. Uh, and I've also seen a number of photos demonstrating how enthusiastically so many people have got stuck into the cheese uh, and uh, the various recipes that we've been suggesting in the previous videos. So thank you for that. Uh, and I'm delighted to be starting filming once again uh, for another online video. So for those of you that are tuning in for the first time, the proposition is very simple. We're gonna be tasting eight wines. I'll be talking you through uh, the nose, the palate, the conclusion, and I'll be making some suggestions and recommendations with uh, food pairing and cheese recommendations. So what's gonna happen now is there's gonna be a short uh, voiceover giving an overview of Spain and the diversity of the grapes and regions and then we'll be ready to start with the first wine tasting, which will be the Verdeco. It is impossible to do justice to Spain in one tasting. Wine is produced from north to south and east to west, ranging from the crisp whites of Galicia, the fortified cherries in the south, the flagship reds of Rioja, Priorat and Ribera de Duero, the carver from Catalonia, and a huge diversity in between with many indigenous grape varieties. Spain has so much to offer. There are almost a million hectares of vines planted throughout Spain, making the country number one in the league table of vineyard coverage. However, due to the arid conditions and subsequent lower yields, France and Italy always have the greater volume of production. In recent years, there has been a concerted effort to protect, invest in and develop the many indigenous grapes that Spain is very proud of, and the temptation to plant swathes of international varieties has been largely resisted. The Menthea grape from Bierzo in northwest of Castiglione is a prime example. Our tasting this month focuses on white wines from Rioja, Rueda, and Terra Alta in southern Catalonia, while we have a strong focus on the classic Tempranillos of Rioja and Ribera del Duero. The first wine we taste is the Verdeco. It comes from Rueda in Castiglione, the green zone just to the south of the city of Valladolid on the map, and it's become the most important region for white wine in Spain. This is largely thanks to the Marques de Riscal, well known for its Rioja, who invested in the region in the 70s and planted Sauvignon Blanc. Their success inspired the traditional Verdeca producers to up their game and replace the tired, oxidised styles with clean, modern, fresh wines, and it is a fabulous success story. The wine from Passos de la Capsula is 100% Verdeco, totally unoaked, and represents the typical clean, fresh style that is popular all over Spain. So, our Verdeco 2019. I'm a huge fan of Verdeco. Uh, it's not as perhaps as well known as Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay or Pinot Grigio, but it finds uh, its uh, perfect expression uh, in the Rueda region. Now, colour-wise, this is lovely pale lemon green in colour, first of all. So let's give it a swirl, break up the surface tension, release the aromas and give the wine a nose. And I think straight away, what you get with the Deco is a very characteristic sort of grapefruit aromas. Um, I've got to be careful sort of saying this at the beginning of any tasting, but there's just that little, little sensation, that hint of, uh, of, of zest or uh, of uh, fruit pith, uh, P-I-T-H, um, which uh, to me is very sort of characteristic of the grape. Uh, so it's, you know, it's clean, it's fresh, it's vibrant. Um, maybe a little hint of sort of peach and stone fruit comes through as well. Okay, so moving on to the palate, give it a good sloosh. And palate wise, I feel it delivers a lot of what the nose was suggesting. So it's clean, it's fresh, you're getting that sort of citrus, grapefruity tang, you know, maybe a little hint of peach or apricot. Uh, just towards sort of the back of the palette. Nice length, nice finish. Now, this is relatively entry-level Verdeco, but I think it demonstrates the quintessential Verdeco character um, with, say, that little sort of hint of bitterness towards the back of the palette, which keeps the wine interesting. Now, as far as food is concerned, this would be absolutely great on its own. A uh, little aperitif kind of wine, but I 
I love this with uh, some freshly uh, deep fried calamari, some really garlicky uh, early mayonnaise, just a little dip of that and a little sip of that, an absolute wine of food heaven for me. Uh, as far as cheese is concerned, interesting one. When we've been in Rueda on wine tours, uh, more often than not, we've been tasting the Badeco in the bodega and they've literally brought out some goat's cheese that they was literally made uh, that morning in a local farm just around the corner from the bodega. Now, appreciate that may not be so easy to achieve. Uh, and actually what I'm suggesting with this wine, uh, something uh, that's a little bit more widely available, certainly from Telling for Cheese, is uh, a Pyrenean goat's cheese called Pardu Goat. Um, but any reasonably hard goat's cheese with a bit of flavour, I think, would work really well. And it's that sort of bitterness, that little tang uh, in the Badeco that I feel really picks up uh, on the goat's cheese. So I have a little bit here, fortunately. So a little nibble of that. A little sip of the wine. And, um, you know, Badeco is not dissimilar to Sauvignon Blanc in some respects. And as we all know, Sauvignon Blanc, goat's cheese, fantastic pairing. This works extremely well. So at this point, we're going to move on to the next wine. So get ready with wine number two, which will be the Rioja Blanco. And there's going to be a short voiceover before that. Our second wine is the Rioja Blanco 2019 from the El Cotto estate. The Rioja region is situated about 90 minutes south of Bilbao and breaks down into three sections, Rioja Alta, Alavesa and Baja, which has been renamed Rioja Oriental. The best Tempranillo fruit comes from Alta and Alavesa, while Garnacha thrives in the hotter Oriental area. Red wine is king, and white Rioja only accounts for around 10% of production, and a decade or so ago, its reputation was generally poor, with a few notable exceptions, such as Vina Tondonia. Since then, there has been a massive improvement, and quality today has never been higher. The Rioja authorities changed the rules in 2018 to allow a broader range of permitted grape varieties to give the opportunity to build on its newfound success, and producers are grasping the moment to extend and develop their range. By Rioja standards, El Cotto is a relatively new estate. Set up in 1970, it has established itself as a leading player in the Riochan wine scene and has a strong presence in both domestic and international markets. They have wineries dedicated to white wine production, situated directly in the vineyards, allowing maximum control over the whole production process. The wine is made from 89% Viura, 6% Verdeco and 5% Sauvignon Blanc. It is fermented and matured in stainless steel tanks. There is no oak treatment. Okay, so we're moving on to our second wine, which is the Rioja Blanco from El Cotto. Now, very similar in style to the Verdeco that we've just tasted, as in it's 100% um, stainless steel fermentation, so no oak treatment at all. So what we're looking for here is that balance between fruit and acidity. Now, colour-wise, very pale, lemony gold, 2019 vintage. So let's give it a swirl, break up the surface tension, release the aromas, and straight away, clean, fresh, aromatic, you know, quite lightly floral. And I think uh, the key difference perhaps between the Rioja Blanco and the Vadeco that we've just been tasting um, is that it hasn't got that sort of that grapefruit tang. Uh, this to me feels a little bit more delicate, a little bit more floral, uh, but very pleasant, very fresh, um, you know, really sort of, uh, uh, really sort of lifts up into your, rose, into your nose. And then just, for me, just a little hint now uh, of, uh, of, of, of stone fruit coming through. Okay, so very attractive on the nose. Let's give it a taste. And I think, once again, the palate is very much delivering what the nose was suggesting. Lovely, clean, fresh fruit. Lovely balancing acidity without being too astringent or harsh uh, or too crisp. Uh, and then the back of the palate is filled with that sort of you know, light, fresh fruit, a little bit of citrus, hints of stone fruit, nice length, nice finish. Um, and it just sort of you know, sits on the palate very, very nicely. 
not a lot of similarities between this and the Vadeco. Yeah, you could drink it as an aperitif quite happily, um, but from a food pairing point of view, or even a food pairing point of view, uh, what really strikes me with this wine would be uh, just a simple platter of uh, some grilled prawns. Uh, I think uh, just sort of, uh, again, sizzling with a, uh, a bit of garlic oil would be absolutely fantastic. Um, as far as cheese is concerned, uh, once again, I feel this would be great with goat's cheese. And for this, uh, I've got a wonderful Spanish hard goat's cheese called Garrochka. And I uh, happen to have a little piece here. Uh, so again, some similarities to the Pardu goat we're tasting with the Vadeco, uh, but this perhaps is a little bit more flavoursome. So let's give that a taste. Lovely texture, a little bit creaminess about it. And then the acidity and freshness of the Rioja, to me, harmonizes perfectly. And it's yet another instance where I feel white wine goes extremely well with cheese. Okay, so that's our Rioja Blanco. That's wine number two. We're now gonna move on to our third wine, which is the Garnacha Blanca, the white Grenache, if you like, uh, from Terra Alta in Catalonia. Our third wine is a little bit more unusual. It is made from Garnacha Blanca, white Grenache. Many of you will be familiar with red Grenache, but it's rarer to see pure varietals made from the white version. The area of production will also be relatively unfamiliar. The DO, Denominación Origen Terra Alta, is situated in the southern part of Catalonia, about 100 kilometers down the coast from Barcelona, and then inland about 100 kilometers from Tarragona. It is the green zone on the bottom left corner of the map. It is a remote area that rarely gets in the news and viticulturally has not received much coverage. However, with the success of Priorat and Monsant just to the north, eyes are turning to Terra Alta for quality and value. The wine comes from Herentia Altez, a small family-owned winery that was established in 2010. With old vines and organic certification, Owner and winemaker Nuria Altez aims to make small parcels of top quality wine from Garnacha that reflect the chalky terroir and hot, dry Mediterranean climate. The wine we are tasting is 100% Garnacha Blanca, stainless steel fermented and with three months spent on the lees prior to bottling. There is no oak ageing. Okay, so our third wine uh, in our classic Wines of Spain tasting uh, is a little bit unusual. Uh, this is a uh, Garnacha Blanca, uh, or white Grenache, uh, and it's not a great variety you see a lot uh, in its pure varietal form, but it really holds its own. It, uh, it's a real uh, centre of uh, excellence, if you like, uh, in southern Catalonia. So this is in a, the area of uh, Terra Alta, uh, it's a little bit further south, uh, as I've already said, from Priorat. Um, and uh, the colour-wise, as you can see, once again, very pale lemony gold, not dissimilar to the previous wines we've already looked at. Uh, but I think where this really comes through as a little bit different is on the nose. And I think straight away you get this distinctive um, notes, a little bit of cumin, uh, you know, spicy, um, and I think you know, indicative, if you like, of the sort of the heat of, of that region, you know, inland uh, from Tarragona, you know, it's remote, it's hot, um, and I think you get that sort of you know, lovely spicy sort of edge sort of coming through on the nose. Um, so uh, let's give it a taste as well. And I think this is the surprising thing, you know, particularly with, you know, Garnacha Blanca, with this wine as it, uh, anyway, is that the nose was giving you that sort of suggestion of, of spice, uh, something, you know, really quite exotic. And then the palate, even more fulfilling. I feel I'm getting a real sort of burst of flavour, uh, that hint of cumin sort of running through the sort of palate, alongside some nice sort of ripe citrus and tropical fruit. Um, and uh, it's really enveloping the mouth. I'm feeling you get a real sort of you know, richness and tang and weight uh, all over the teeth, mouth and gums. And I think the palate really delivers a punch that uh, you know, maybe you weren't quite expecting as much from the nose. So to me, absolutely delicious uh, uh, and unknown, relatively unknown, uh, but it's definitely you know, a great variety that you know, we'd like to see more uh, and it's definitely worth looking out for. Now, Food pairing, 
Um, I'm going a little bit exotic with this one because uh, I think there's so many interesting flavours uh, coming out from the Garnacha Blanca. Uh, so I'm thinking spicy crab cakes with a little side of stuffed courgette flowers. Uh, I think that would be absolutely sensational with this. Um, but uh, then cheese. Uh, now, something a little bit, maybe you won't be expecting this, uh, is this is a proper, seriously aged uh, gore with uh, kefili. So proper kefili, um, uh, really crum creamy, but still retains that sort of sense of crumbliness that a good kefili should have. And I feel those sort of those cumin notes, that spice will work really well with this type of cheese. And I have to say, I'm right. That really works for me. I love the texture of the cheese and the sort of, again, the sort of the spice of the wine just marries harmoniously with it. So enjoy that. We're going to move on to the fourth wine, which will be the Rioja Rosado. So get ready for that. The fourth wine we taste is the Rioja Rosado from El Cotto. Rosada Rioja is produced in even smaller quantities than White Rioja, but that has changed in recent years with the massive growth in the popularity of rosé around the world. Historically, Rioja Rosado had to attain a certain level of depth of colour and were often quite tannic, food-orientated styles. The rules have now been changed to allow producers to make lighter styles and thus compete with the onslaught of Provencal rosé that dominates the shelves. This wine from El Cotto is a blend of Tempranillo and Garnacha, the rosé colour is achieved mainly by releasing fermenting juice from the tanks after 24 to 36 hours maceration with the skins and then combining with a bit of press wine that has a bit more colour. There is no malolactic conversion or oak ageing. So, our fourth wine of our classic Spanish wines tasting is a Rosado. And uh, of all the four videos we've done so far, this being the fourth, uh, this is the first rosé we've done. So uh, they say, a quick look at the colour, first of all, uh, a little bit um, deeper uh, in colour perhaps than uh, the rosés we've all got used to. You know, Provence rosé often, you know, barely a perception of pink, but uh, yeah, this is uh, Tempranillo and Grenache rosé, uh, has a little bit of colour to it. So on the nose, first off, now, uh, strawberries, raspberries, lovely intensity, um, you know, lovely sort of structure. Uh, and to me already, I'm thinking this is going to be a food type rosé rather than a sort of a, uh, a light, uh, you know, late morning kind of rosé. Uh, so, you know, lovely sort of strawberry raspberry fruit uh, on the palate. And I think the two grapes, the Tempranillo, the Garnacha, you can see that structure. You feel it on the back of the palate. Now, I'm not saying it's short of fruit, absolutely not, but it's got loads of fruit, lots of ripeness, um, but it's that sort of little tannic structure um, that I think is really making this wine, A, uh, attractive as a food rosé, um, but also differentiates it from the sort of the, the, you know, the current trend towards these you know, very, very light styles uh, of rosé. Um, and I think food-wise, it really does lend itself to a platter of smoked salmon, I think would be absolutely great. Um, or maybe just some, some baby squid, uh, something like that would be equally lovely. Um, and then cheese-wise, um, there's a, a real terrific pairing that uh, I think is going to work really well. Uh, there's a cheese called Mahon, uh, and it comes from the island of Menorca. Uh, and I've got a little piece here. And, you know, cow's milk cheese, um, semi-soft, and I think it's got the enough sort of structure and taste to go with that structure of the wine. So let's give it a go. Lovely pairing. And I think it's that little, little bite of tannin um, combined with the right fruit that just sort of works with a reasonably flavoursome cheese like this. Super. Okay. So let's move on. We're moving on to the first of the reds, which will be the Rioja Crianza from the El Cotto Vineyard. Our fifth wine is the Rioja Crianza 2016 from El Cotto. 
The wine is made from 100% Tempranillo and spends a minimum of 12 months in American oak barrels, followed by a further six months in bottle prior to release. It's worth taking a look at the ageing requirements for Red Rioja. Red Rioja has to undergo more wood ageing than White Rioja, as you might expect. For Grand Reserva, the wine cannot be released until five years after harvest, of which 24 months must be spent in both barrel and bottle. Reservas can't be released until three years after harvest, with at least a year in barrel and six months in bottle. Crianthas must spend at least a year in barrel and cannot be released until two years after harvest. So moving on to our fifth wine of the tasting. This is our first red. So this is the Rioja Crianza 2016 uh, from El Cotto. Now, 100% Tempranillo, and a lot of Riochas uh, often have a blend or are a blend of Tempranillo, Garnacha, uh, possibly a Graciano, uh, even Mazuelo. Uh, but pure 100% Tempranillo, which is the, a move towards perhaps a slightly more modern uh, style. But uh, colour wise, you know, medium deep uh, in red. Uh, looking still that little hint of youth, little hint of purple at the rim perhaps, um, given you know, it's 2016, so just a few years old. So on the nose, first of all, now, you know, we have so many benchmarks for Rioja, um, and I think there are so many styles, you know, producers have their own philosophies, uh, you know, there's modern styles, there's traditional styles, and I feel straight away on the nose, this is fruit driven. Uh, there's a nice ripe berry fruits coming through on the nose. Um, the sort of the backbone of, of oak is present, but without being dominating or overpowering. Uh, so, you know, it's fresh, it's forward uh, in, its, uh, uh, in its approach. So let's give it a taste. And palette wise, delivering, I think again, a lot of what the nose was suggesting. So clean, fresh fruit, light spice, and the oak is just assisting in the sort of the, the structure of the wine. It's not overpowering. I don't feel like I'm biting to a tree. Uh, it's just giving a little bit of texture, a little bit of weight to the wine. Uh, you know, it's relatively soft, relatively straightforward, um, you know, nice sort of length. Uh, and, you know, this makes it a very, very versatile wine. Um, now, you know, it's almost a sort of, you know, drink any time kind of wine. Um, now, food-wise, uh, I'm thinking, Probably a, a simple platter of cold meats, some ham on the Iberico, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, sort of tapas style Rioja. Uh, I feel this would be absolutely perfect. Uh, Cheese-wise, um, how long did you think it would take before we got to Manchego? Now is the time. Uh, but there is Manchego and there's Manchego. And if you go to the supermarket and, and buy their basic Manchego, it's often quite pale in colour hasn't been aged for very long and can be a little bit bland. So, you know, try and source aged Manchego, artisan producers, um, and get a little bit more, you know, look for wine, a cheese with a bit more color. Uh, this came from Teddington Cheese. And I think you get that depth and texture and taste uh, that one is looking for in really good Manchego. So classic, use not. This has got a lovely taste, lovely, creaminess about it, not too powerful, and then goes with the wine. A delight. You know, the tannins aren't too powerful. There isn't too much of a fight at all. Harmonizes nicely. You know, a real classic match. Rioja with a Manchego. Does it get much better? Okay, so get ready for the Izadi Reserva, wine number six. Our sixth wine is the Rioja Reserva from Vigna Izardi. The Izardi estate was founded in 1987 by Gonzalo Anton, who broke away from the family firm in order to make a more modern style of Rioja. They are based in the town of Villabuena in the Rioja Alavesa. They have created a superb brand since then and have also set up projects in Rueda and Ribera do Duero. We had the pleasure of visiting their estate on tour in Rioja in 2005 and Ribera do Duero in 2019. Like the El Cotto Crianza, the wine is also made from 100% Tempranillo and spends 16 months in 73% American oak and 27% French oak, to be precise. 20% of the barrels were new. The wine spent a further two years in bottle, 
before release. Okay, so we're now moving on to wine number six. This is the Rioja Reserva from Vigna Izardi, a lovely family owned estate uh, we've visited in the past on wine tours. And a step up now, because obviously we've gone from the Crianza, from El Cotto, and we're now moving up to Reserva. Uh, and I think straight away, um, you look at the colour, perhaps a little bit more viscous, a bit more depth of colour, first of all. Uh, it's a year older, 2015, so it hasn't got that uh, tang of purple uh, just at the rim. So on the nose, first of all, I think straight away, more richness, more intensity, more concentration. Uh, and I think the sort of the presence of the oak is very much sort of making itself known. It's a combination in this instance of French and American oak, uh, and that sort of spicy, creamy vanilla, maybe a little hint of coconut as well, uh, to me is coming through very clearly on the nose. Then moving on to the palette. Rich, spicy, full of berry fruit. Uh, there's a sort of savoury character to it as well. Um, and you know, lovely weight, lovely texture. But importantly, I feel you know we've got five, nearly five years of age. You know, the tannins are well developed. Uh, they're not feeling too astringent. There's a, um, a harmony between the fruit, the acidity, the tannins, and the oak. So it feels very approachable now. Um, you know, I think we could easily leave this maybe another two, two or three years. Um, uh, but it's approaching, I think, a nice plateau. Uh, of uh, being ready to drink. So very well balanced, lovely wine. Um, food wise, um, now what immediately comes to mind uh, with a wine like this uh, would be another Spanish classic, um, but done well. So uh, really spicy, rich tomatoey albondigas uh, or meatballs, I think would be absolutely super with this. But you know, slow roasted, low temperature, you know, three or four hours in the, in the low temperature of the oven, um, and you get a real sort of melting, caramelised sort of tomatoey sauce. Uh, I think it would be absolutely super with this. Now, cheese-wise, um, again, it's a little bit different um, to, to, you know, to pair with. Um, and what I've paired it with uh, is a cheese called uh, Cironi, C-I-R-O-N-E. Uh, it's a Swiss cheese, uh, aged about three years, uh, hard cow's milk. And I've got a piece here. Um, and it's got a lovely dense texture and I feel it's got you know the lovely weight and because the tannins are soft uh, in the wine I think there'll be a lovely harmony um, between the sort of the fruit of the, of the, uh, of the wine and the sort of the, the density of the cheese. Let's give it a go. Mm. I have to say that is a really really harmonious match. You get some little, there's a little crunch almost in the cheese um, from the aging, a little bit of sort of salt crystals start coming out. And that just enhances the sort of the way the wine marries and uh, tastes with the cheese. Super. So, take your time, finish a bit more of that with the cheese or the spicy albondi gas. And uh, we're gonna move on to wine number seven which is the Ribera del Duero Crianza 2016 from Val Duero. The final two wines of the Spanish tasting come from the Val Duero estate in Ribera del Duero. This will be the final voiceover, so please have both wines ready. Val Duero is one of my favourite estates in Spain, and we have visited many times on wine tours. Situated very close to the town of Aranda de Duero, their vineyards are at 800 to 900 metres above sea level. They have a fabulous modern cellar built into the hillside with tunnels leading up to a glorious dining and tasting room which overlooks the vineyards. They are legendary hosts and have been incredibly generous with their wines at the lunches we have enjoyed there. Their latest ad addition to the cellar, which we saw last year, is their Vega style barrel museum where young and up and coming artists create some stunning art. There is a short clip now.
The Criantha 2016 is made from 100% Tempranillo and spends 15 months in French and American oak, followed by a further 12 months in bottle before release. The Reserva 2012 is also made from 100% Tempranillo and spends 24 months in French and American oak, followed by a further year in bottle prior to release. So, wine number seven, and this is the Criantha 2016 from the Valduero estate in Ribeiro del Duero. And Valduero, one of my favourite estates, uh, we've been there numerous times now on tour over the years. Um, and very high quality uh, winemakers uh, make a superb range, have the most amazing cellars, um, and are legendary for their hospitality. So the Corianth 2016, 100% Tempranillo, uh, like both the previous Riocas, uh, and inevitably there's a comparison between Rioja and Ribera del Duero. And generally speaking, I find with Riberas, they tend to be a little bit fuller bodied, a little bit richer, um, I think because of their, you know, a little bit further inland, get a bit more heat. Um, the style of Tempranillo is just that, you know, a little bit heavier, richer, maybe slightly more alcoholic as well. So here, looking at the Criantha, you know, certainly in comparison with the El Cotto Rioja, you know, this is more deeply coloured, you know, much more dense. And then nose-wise, you know, it's 2016, same year as the, as the Rioja. Uh, this has a real super concentration, um, really spicy, uh, intense fruit, uh, really, really rich, you know, gorgeous nose, uh, really suggests it's going to be a sort of powerful palette to follow. So let's give that a look. And I think straight away, think back to the Rioja, light, easy drinking, you know, great for its style. But this, much more serious, much more intense, much more concentrated, fantastic length, really spicy, lots of weight. Um, you know, and the sort of, there's that sort of real sort of uh, vein of vanilla uh, that you know, complements the sort of the ripe fruit perfectly as well. So this is, food wise, crying out uh, for an absolute classic, uh, which would be roast lamb. Um, and uh, we've enjoyed the most sensational lunches at Val Duero, uh, culminating in, I think, uh, drinking pretty much uh, an ocean of this uh, with some absolutely perfectly cooked roast lamb. Um, and cheese wise, um, I'm heading back to Manchego, but you know, some serious two, three, even four year old Manchego. Uh, get some real weight, some real texture, some real flavour in the cheese. I have a piece here. So a bit more complex cheese than the, than the one we tasted previously. We'll marry harmoniously with the spice richness of this wine. Mm. Absolutely super. Cracking wine, lovely winery savour this so in a minute we'll move on to our final wine which is the Reserva 2012 from Valduero. So our final wine of our classic wines of Spain tasting is the Reserva 2012 from Valduero uh, in the Ribera de Duero and culminating with another absolutely classic wine one of my favourites and uh, looking at colour first of all um, 2012 it's got some bottle age uh, we're starting to see some evolution in the color uh, but still pretty deep pretty dense um, and uh, uh, nose wise I think straight away the extended amount of oak aging starts to come through you get this real sort of you know complex rich vanilla uh, aromas but they're interspersing and harmonizing with really sort of ripe fruits, berry fruits, a bit of dried fruit coming through as well, lots of pepper spice, um, so an awful lot going on. And the more you swirl it around, the more the wine sort of unfurls and yields more aroma. So fantastic nose, first of all. So let's move on to the palette. And I think what we're comparing here is not only a contrast, with the Criantha from Valduero. And I think straight away you see the richness, the intensity, you know, that step up, that level up uh, in concentration and weight and richness, uh, but also comparing with the two Riocas. 
uh, yeah, both the Creantha and the Reserva. Again, this depth that you feel uh, just sort of marks out that sort of essential difference between Rioja and Ribera do Duero. So palette-wise, super rich, really dense, uh, but the tannins, you know, with eight years age nearly, uh, you know, nicely sort of soft, you know, well integrated with the fruit and the oak, uh, lovely balancing acidity, um, uh, incredible finish. You know, the wine just goes on and on and on. Uh, to me, absolutely stunning wine. Um, Food-wise, you know, I think one could drink quite a lot of this uh, with some another classic of the region, roast the suckling pig. And uh, I think the way that works because of the sort of the richness of the pork, uh, maybe the crackling, that sort of that, that fattiness, the, uh, the richness of the wine will just harmonise perfectly with that kind of dish. Now, cheese wise, um, another Spanish uh, cheese that I've got to go with this, um, and it's very lightly smoked, and it's called the Idiotharbal. And I'm a little bit wary of smoked cheese generally. But this is just very lightly smoked and I think because of the, if you like, little bit hint of smokiness that I think is in the wine as well, I think it will marry harmoniously with this. So a little nibble of it is that up. A little sip of the wine. And then bam, those little smoky notes in the wine marries with that smoky notes in the cheese. There's a lovely, you know, harmonious sort of taste throughout. I can still taste the wine, still taste the cheese, lovely, beautiful blending together, super finish. So that's it. That concludes our uh, classic wines of Spain video. Uh, obviously, it's impossible to do justice uh, to the wines of Spain in one sitting, one tasting. But I think we've seen uh, a good selection, uh, a variety, good uh, range of great varieties. Um, and uh, hopefully once again, uh, I have uh, put in the frame a range of cheeses and uh, recipe suggestions uh, that you've either been trying uh, as I speak uh, or you can try later uh, in due course when tasting the wines again. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in, for watching the video, sharing Zoom in incredibly with uh, friends and family. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again. Um, and I'm sure we'll be making more videos uh, as the year goes on. And finally, one big thank you, as ever, to Julia Syred, who has done all the editing, the filming, the retakes, the endless retakes. Uh, a great big thank you to her. So um, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you.